Hello and welcome to Storytelling for Better Dental Outcomes. I'm Dr. Mandana Donahue, an oral pathologist, but I have been a dentist long enough to understand all the different roles we are called to play. And I'm convinced in every one of those roles, we will have better outcomes and find them much more satisfying if we master the art of storytelling and public speaking. The session is to convince you of the importance and to set you on your path towards excellence in storytelling. Coming to the session, convincing dentists that we need storytelling, well, we needed someone from a similar background like us, us a background in science. So we are very lucky to have Rashid and Kapadia with a background in marine engineering and project management with us today. Originally from Belgaum, Rashid is now based in Houston, Texas. He discovered the importance of better storytelling and better communication while leading projects and committed to acquiring mastery in the art of public speaking and storytelling. Never doing anything by halves where most of us would go ahead and buy a book or two to gain the knowledge we want, he actually gained enough knowledge to go ahead and author a book on the topic. The book is Necessary Bridges, Public Speaking and Storytelling for Project Managers and Engineers. It's filled with practical ideas and a step-by-step -step action plan that will work for anyone, including dentists. I know because I read it. I must admit, it is really exciting to be in a session with the author of a great book I have read recently. So I really don't want to wait any longer. Let me just say welcome Rashid and it is so very nice to have you joining us today. Thank you Mandana. Our entire topic, the full agenda, can be covered today by answering three questions. Why public speaking? Why storytelling? And then the bulk of our talk, how storytelling? So let's get to question number one. Why public speaking? Because you may think public speaking is important or you may not think it's important. But however important you think public speaking is, Public speaking is going to be more important tomorrow than it is today. Public speaking is going to be more important tomorrow than it is today. Now that's a statement from Chris Anderson. Chris Anderson's the leader of TED Talks and he has been at the forefront of a revival, almost a revolution taking place in the public speaking world. He calls this a talk renaissance. He says that we are in the midst of a talk renaissance right now. And he's the person who observed that no matter how important you think that public speaking is today, it is going to be more important tomorrow. Let me see if I can convince you of that. A talk renaissance. So what was the original renaissance? The original renaissance, it was a bridge between the middle ages and modernity. And central to this evolution from middle ages to modernity, this transformation was one invention. And that invention was the printing press. The printing press, it exponentially amplified the reach and the power of those who could write. And suddenly because of this invention and the spread of knowledge, of ideas, of insights, that went far and wide. And that is what that spread of insights, of knowledge, that is what evolved into modernity. That was the original Renaissance. And what Chris Anderson observes that taking the place of the printing press is today the concept of online video. What online video enables, like the printing press did a long time ago, is to exponentially amplify the reach, the power, the impact of those who can speak. You could speak to an audience of 100 people, 2,000 people, but that same video recorded can reach millions of people. This is the invention that is driving what he calls a talk renaissance. There is a talk renaissance going on right now. And because of that, no matter how important you think public speaking is today, it is going to be more important tomorrow. More and more of our communication will move from what we have been used to in the past to online video. It could be anything. It could be a proposal for work. It could be an interview. It could be the way you deal with your teams. But this is going to become more and more common. 
Today, you may think public speaking, storytelling is an advantage if you can do it well, but maybe five, 10 years from now, it will have become a disadvantage. If you can't do it, you are disadvantaged. And maybe much further down the road, if you can't do it at all, you may well be considered professionally illiterate. If you can't communicate on this medium, you may not be as useful as you can potentially be. So that is why we say public speaking and storytelling is going to be more important tomorrow than it is today. That's the answer to our first question. Why public speaking? Because there is a talk renaissance going on today. And because of this renaissance, public speaking and storytelling will be more important tomorrow than it is today. Question number one. Now, question number two, why storytelling? First, let me say stories, they make you care. Stories drive action. And more than that, stories can facilitate, can enable very large scale cooperation amongst profession, among societies. They create social bonding. This ability of our species to communicate vastly is something that no other species can do. And at the foundation of that, at least one element of that is our ability to create, narrate and spread stories. So we can say this. Storytelling is ancient and it is enduring. Uh, this ability of ours to tell stories, to create shared narratives, is probably one of the pillars that was responsible for us becoming the most dominant species on this planet. Indeed, archaeologists, anthropologists, they suggest that our forebearers, maybe even before we Homo sapiens, the other human tribes, there were meeting places around fires. This seems to be something that was unique in the evolution of the homo, spe the homo species and especially homo sapiens. And this ability to tell stories around fires created a unique evolution of human consciousness and the human mind. And it may be that this is really, really ancient, far more ancient than we appreciate. So storytelling is ancient and it is enduring. So let's answer the second question again. Why storytelling? Because this ancient bequest, this bequeath, makes us somehow care and it drives us to action and it enables large scale, flexible cooperation amongst all of us. Which brings us now to our third point. How do you do storytelling? And first I wanna say right away that we are going to restrict this answer to a very small segment, storytelling in business, in professions. How can we use storytelling within the business world, within the professional world to get better outcomes? That is the focus of today's topic. I wanna say something. There's a link between storytelling and public speaking. That's why I brought this up. If you can do public speaking well, you can probably communicate well one-on-one. -on -one. And there's an age old formula in public speaking. It goes like this, make your point and then tell a story. Alternately, tell a story and make your point. Now, why does this work? Because when you make your point, the person you're speaking to, they comprehend, okay, this is what I need to do. But when you tell a story, they start caring. Why is this? Because stories, they elicit emotions. And it seems that emotions at a biological level lay down memories, what you what stirs your emotions, gets stored into memory. And it is this combination that energizes us to action. So why, uh, let, let's repeat this again. Tell a story, make a point, or make a point and tell a story to make that point more memorable and actionable. Give the instructions to your patient, Tell them a success story and that will make them remember the instructions and act on them. Make a point, tell a story to make that point more memorable and more actionable. So I want to keep it to four basics on storytelling, how storytelling right now. Do not use stories in business unless they are intimately tied with a point. You want to make someone care about the instruction they comprehend. So use story only when they are driving home a point, making it memorable, making it actionable. And second is it takes a little bit of effort. Stories have structures and they have guidelines. And it is a good idea to get familiar with these guidelines and structures. 
Now, what Mandana will do after this is she'll put in a, in the description a link to six TED Talks. Three of them basically answer the first question, why storytelling? And three of them answer the question, how storytelling? So this would be one, if you feel committed, I got to do this. <coughs> Check out these TED Talks because what I'm telling you in five or 10 minutes, they will give you over an hour with very good detail. One of them is from the uh, movie studio, Pixar, how he came into storytelling. Another TED talk is from someone who was a leader at the World Bank, a very senior executive who turned his career around by using stories. The third one is someone who's from the world of marketing and PR and political consulting. And all of them say, whoever tells you the best story, they're the people who win. Whoever tells the best story, they win. So for this, keep this in mind. If you're going to commit to it, stories have a guideline. They have structure and you should be intimately familiar with it. Now in the world of business, or in professions, it is a good idea to make the story minimalist. Keep it as short as possible. This is not entertainment. This is not on the stage. It is only there to make a point memorable and actionable. So minimalist, clarity, brevity, clarity, brevity. This is the holy grail of effective storytelling in business. And something else you have to remember, a story is a story only if it has a conflict and a resolution. There's some problem that you want to solve and there's a resolution. There's some hardship that you faced and there's a resolution. There was some undesirable outcome that you wanted and the story tells how you overcame that and you got a better outcome. So stories have to have a conflict and a resolution. Let me just go over these four points. One is use stories only to make points or instructions memorable and actionable. Keep in mind, they have a structure. Take time to construct your story so that it works in the best interests of your patients. Minimalist, keep it as short and as tight as possible, clarity and brevity, and there has to be a conflict and a resolution. So Mandana, what I think we'll do now, rather than me continuing to talk, is we're going to watch a video, it may be four or five minutes, if you can play that. What's gonna happen is this speaker is going to show you graphs and stories and guidelines and how it takes a lot to construct a story and also it can lead to immense success. So Mandana, why don't you play that video, please? Well, there's no reason why the simple shapes of story can't be fed into computers. They are beautiful shapes. This is the GI axis, good fortune, ill fortune. Sickness and poverty down here, wealth and, and boisterous good health up there. Here's the very middle. Now, this is the BE axis. B stands for beginning. <laughs> e stands for electricity. <laughs> now, this is an exercise in relativity, really, is the shape of the curves of what matters and not their origins. So we'll start a little above average, is why, why get a depressing person? We'll start <coughs> the whole thing. We call this story man in hole, but it needn't be about a man and it needn't be about somebody getting into a hole. But it's just a good way to remember it. Somebody gets into trouble, gets out of it again. People love that story. <laughs> they never get sick of it. All right, not copyrighted. Another story is also a beautiful curve and easily fed into a computer called Boy Gets Girl, but it needn't be that. Just a way to remember it. Start on an average day, average person, not expecting anything to happen a day like any other. Find something wonderful, just loves it. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> Got it back again. People like that. Now, these are beautiful curves, and this gets a little complicated. Is computers can now play chess, so I don't know why they can't digest this very difficult curve I'm going to draw for you now. And it so happens that this is the most popular story in our civilization, Western civilization. As we love to hear this story, every time it's retold, somebody makes another million dollars. You're welcome to do it. Now, 
Surprisingly enough, I've said it's depressing. You know, people don't like stories below about below average days and people. But we're going to start way down here. Worse than that, who is so low? It's a little girl. What's happened? Her mother has died. Her father has remarried a vile-tempered, ugly woman with, with two nasty daughters, big daughters. You've heard it. See? Anyway, there's a party at the palace that night. She can't go. She has to help everybody else get ready. She has to stay home. Now, does she sink lower? No. She's a staunch little girl, and she has had the maximum whack from fate, which is the loss of her mother. She, she can't go any lower than that. Okay, so the fairy godmother comes. Gives her shoes, gives her stocking, gives her <laughs> mascara. Gives her a means of transportation. Goes to the party. Dances with the prince. Has a swell time. Boring, 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 boring. Now there's a slight inclination to that line as I've drawn it because it takes perhaps 20 seconds, 30 seconds for a grandfather clock to strike 12. Does she wind up at the same level? Of course not. She will remember that dance for the rest of her life. Now, she poops along on this level till the prince comes to shoe fits. She achieves off-scale happiness. <laughs> Okay, so I, I hope that made the point that there is structure. And if you're going to tell a story, that it, it appears to be easy, but it does require a lot of work. So what we did is I actually wanted to see if we could demonstrate this in practice. And I have to compliment Pandana. She's really worked with me very sincerely and hard to do this. So I asked her a question and I asked her to record it. And then we tried to see if we could put all this advice that we have been giving you into practice. So the question I asked her was, Mandana, what is oral pathology? I didn't know. And can you give me a real world example of how it works? So she's gonna play a video of the way she answered it first. And then I'll ask her the question again and she'll answer it again. And maybe you can see that it does take some work to tighten it up. Okay, Mandana, over to you. Oh, Mandana, tell me what oral pathology is and give me an example of how it helped one of your patients. Okay, so Rashid, oral pathology is the diagnostic science of dentistry. So basically, we are the ones who diagnose cases, whether it is with a blood test or when, when, the, when the patients have some lesion, it's normally sent to us, we are the ones who diagnose. Now coming to when it helped a patient. One of my uh, best memories is of a time when a patient who had polio, basically, so he already had a disability, a young man of about uh, 35 years or so, came to us and he had this lesion, basically, which was like a hole right through and through on his cheek. Uh, and our oral surgery department, that's the department who is in charge of the treatments, he, they had referred us the case to just see what the tissue was and to give the diagnosis. But from the tissue examinations, we found that it was definitely not oral cancer. Now they were thinking that it was oral cancer and the treatment for oral cancer basically involves uh, removing that entire involved part and a lot more, basically the bone, the tissues, and even a portion of the skin and structures of the neck are removed. Now this would leave the patients with another way, this is what I would say, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, are disabilities and also uh, a lot of damage to his face. So, and main thing is when it is required because it's the treatment, well, it is the treatment. But in this case, we were not convinced that it was the treatment. We asked the oral surgery department to give us more time and to do more tests, but they seemed very sure that it was an oral cancer and they wanted to treat fast, which was also the right thing. If it's an oral cancer, because the longer you wait, the more it uh, spreads, the more damage it does, the more risk to a patient's life. But uh, we were not convinced. So eventually we took a little, uh, what I would say, uh, 
different route. We ourselves, uh, we bypassed protocol. We smuggled the patient out, uh, took him to the medical college, did the x-rays, did the tests, and found that he had tuberculosis. Uh, we informed oral surgery that this is what we have found. And uh, then they uh, started the treatment. Patient was treated with just medication and very slight uh, cleaning of the wound. And he was perfectly fine. For years together, he kept coming to us and thanking us for having saved him. And uh, that really meant a lot. And I think in a lot of ways, it lived up to what I would always do. And I, what I always told my students to do is that patients first, patients always come first, irrespective of anything. You just do whatever you got to do to get the treatment, to do the best for the patient. Okay, thanks. So Mandela, thanks. let me summarize. The point you are making is put the patient first. It, you know, protocol and all matters, but put the patient first. And the conflict here is an incorrect diagnosis and whatever you had to do to get the correct diagnosis. So in the briefest version of storytelling, you'd make the point, and then you'd get to the conflict as quickly as possible with the resolution, which is the point that will make it memory. Oh, I must make sure that if I'm going to have a surgery, I need to check this out with the oral pathologist. That's what they want you want them to remember. So why don't you try telling us the story again using some of the guidelines we discussed. So here's the question. Mandana, I have no idea what oral pathology is. So what is it? And give me an example that it really works. So Rashid, oral pathology is diagnostics in dentistry and oral pathologists are like the detectives of dentistry. Now, why is that necessary? Because a number of lesions can look alike but need very different treatments. So we have to give the final diagnosis. Like there was this one time when oral surgery sent a young patient to us with a large lesion on his cheek and they wanted us to confirm their diagnosis of oral cancer. The lesion looked very ominous and they were convinced it was rapidly progressing cancer. They put a rush on it and were all set to go ahead with the excision. But there was one problem, it was not cancer. What we found was that it was most likely tuberculosis. Although we needed more time, to do more tests and confirm our diagnosis, but sadly they were not ready to wait. And we were at a total impasse. Every one of us focused on the patient's well-being and yet in total disagreement. So what to do? Well, at this point, what we did was we bypassed all protocol, smuggled the patient out, got the tests done, got the proof that he had tuberculosis, informed oral surgery who then changed their treatment treated the patient accordingly, and soon the lesion healed. It was a happy ending really for all of us and for the patient, of course. So for the best outcome, what we need is a diagnosis from oral pathology and treatment from oral surgery, with patient's well-being always remaining as the only consideration. And that's the best way things will work. Okay, nice, nice. Though if you continue working with me, I can cut it down to half. <laughs> there, there's still <laughs> point, conflict, point. So, but this is how we work through storytelling. I, I can actually give you an example, a little story. I remember once when I was to sail on ship, they used to send those videos and I saw Michael Jordan for the first time throwing the basketball and it made it look so easy. I was convinced I could do it. Anyone can do it. That's what expertise is. It takes lots and lots and lots of practice before it you really tighten stories to the way uh, that can work best in business. And in fact, uh, we discussed this. There's one of the videos that we recommend is Steve Denning. He was the some big shot president of World Bank who used storytelling. And he puts a demonstration. He takes quite a complex story and in, he reduces it to one minute and shows it to us in the TED Talk. So that would be your challenge. One minute is all you got, Mandana. Point, story, point, and memorable and actionable. So that's the way to do it. Uh, do you want to say anything or shall we yes. kind of move to a summary? Uh, no, that's okay. But I, I think, you know, actually I should say something, you know, in this exercise, two or three things I found, which I think very important. When you really try to cut down something, you begin to realize what is at the heart of the story. And there was a time where uh, one of the times when we discussed and we had cut the story, but when you related it back to me, I realized that some things were now, the, you had not got them the way I meant them. So my message was actually not focused enough. So that is another thing which I think is very important to always remember what is the message you want to give. 
you know so that that is another thing that uh, that and it takes a lot of work oh i've worked on this more than like i said this felt like an exam it was like 30 years back and i was giving an exam <laughs> but it comes yes. down to this you, your focus is forced to be directed on this is the point and this is the conflict if you can build it around that so yeah that's your challenge for now one one minute in one minute you've got to tell the story as quickly as possible and uh, you will find your patients will remember it will will come to appreciate the yes. story of oral pathology much more okay shall we move to a summary actually let's do it in question form so yes. we use stories to make messages memorable but there's another technique in public speaking which is called repetition if you repeat it a few times so basically i'm going to ask mandana the question then we'll discuss it so that is our summary for this session then we'll have a q and a and then i'll close with some thoughts and comments okay so mandana our entire session was three questions first why public speaking right so rashid what i gathered from this was that public speaking is of course important because it is today itself important and it gives a lot of advantage but even if not today in the future it is going to be absolutely essential i don't think anyone can really do well or survive possibly as a professional without it and you can add <laughs> yeah basically there's a talk renaissance going on because of online video and because of this renaissance public speaking and storytelling is going to be more important tomorrow than it is today okay why storytelling stories are the only way we can really get people to care because uh, otherwise facts science logs tables are not going to work i'm not going to get someone to actually go and brush their teeth just because i tell them you are going to have caries if you don't brush your teeth that doesn't really work and we have seen it not working so the only way to have an impact to bring about action is true stories which is i guess historically tested and uh, it also helps for collaborations for interactions for a larger uh, groups to actually work together because we can uh, build a common focus and a common uh, uh, okay a common focus let me stop there okay so stories make us care points make us comprehend once we care we take action stories enable action and stories create large scale uh, uh facilitate i should say large scale and flexible cooperation and collaboration and another way of saying it is facts get forgotten stories stick facts tell stories sell facts tell stories tell facts get forgotten stories stick so that is why storytelling and how storytelling this is a complicated problem that if your viewers want to take this to the next step there's no shortcut sorry you got to watch those four ted talks analyze them yourself but let's talk about the four points that we spoke about how storytelling what is the first point right so the storytelling first stories. one was that there are guidelines no the Please. first point was don't use them unless there's a point got right it. yes you're right So okay, that's why yes. you just waste the patient's time. Don't do story unless there's a point. The second, the second point is right. The second right. point is the, about there are guidelines. There has to be a yes. There has to be a beginning and end. A message which then is uh, focused and the and the story is either follow a pointing basically is building around that point. Yes, it is to make the point memorable and actionable. Okay, the third right. point in business. how to do storytelling keep it minimalist go ahead keep it minimal yes clarity brevity clarity and brevity yes. and the fourth point was they have to have a conflict and a resolution without right. that it's not a story yes so all with this by what is the conflict that people like he showed in the graph people love it when you overcome a conflict so these are the fours make sure you don't use stories without having a point associated with it keep it minimalist uh there has to be a conflict okay so that sums up the the bulk of our session today i hope it was a bit useful and at least planted a seed in some of your uh, audience but we can take a few questions now or comments or you can open it up the way you'd like yes so you know the main thing that i would uh, first ask uh, rashid is 
for us as doctors that we work for years to see that our emotions are not really directly visible and passed on to the patient i see a horrible case i don't want the patient to see that on my face i have a student for that matter who is doing very poorly i do not want that patient that student to realize just how poorly because that may totally demoralize them now we work at this on the other hand storytelling requires some authenticity so there has to be a feeling it to make someone else care i have to care and i have to show that i care how to reach that balance any suggestions yeah sure i get this a lot uh, basically don't be any emotion that do not bring about good outcome manage them professionally the, it comes down to this honor your emotions and elicit emotions only because they drive uh, a care memories and action so just this, this is one of the dark sides of storytelling someone with mal intent and great storytelling skill you see at the foundation of all huge genocide huge human tragedy there would be someone with mal intent and extremely good storytelling skill so to answer your questions when you are making your point is when you be professional throughout your communication and your treatment with the patient or the students be professional but when you are telling stories at that point you are harvesting there's a new power that we can bring to be more effective in our teaching we maybe make the memory stronger we make the desire to act stronger by utilizing a very ancient bequeath called storytelling so keep it separate be very very careful about not being emo emotionally manipulated that's what we say when we know if we show our emotion then it's bad for the patient no that's not what we want to do we can honor our emotions we can even perhaps find in that a seed of a story that we can tell other data students you know i was behaving this way with the student i had to get a grip on myself they you'll find a conflict out there you can have a point you can have this conflict and you can get another story as to how to teach more effectively does that answer your question yes it does it does definitely okay. so i have one more question and that is after seeing just how much time it took me to shorten this one story now i can imagine that most dentists are not going to be i mean we if we are talking about getting messages and getting patients say to follow instructions uh they are not going to be able to do this every time for every patient is it possible that we build up uh, you know a sort of a collection of stories that point that give a specific point you know that for example uh, you should um, be careful not to you know spit for the next half an hour or for the next day you know just after an extraction because otherwise it could cause problem now if we can build the stories and keep them ready it will it work yeah that's that's definitely in part of your professional development is to have your own arsenal of story then normally personal stories work well so to take this example you can have a, a story built around two patients one who followed the instructions and one who didn't so you have the point do not spit you will cause damage to whatever we have done and then you can say for example there was this patient he would never listen never listen then he keeps coming back he keeps coming back more costs more suffering for everyone and there are some patients who do listen so you have a conflict and you have a point but yes uh, in order to use them effectively they're not going to be spontaneous they must appear to be spontaneous but they do take preparation it's like a basketball player when he's throwing it everything is spontaneous but there has been tons and tons of practice and dribbling and training that's gone on behind it so absolutely correct if you want to be a master of storytelling and use it effectively it would be better to ask what are the problems i want to solve and what personal stories and conflicts can i associate with it so yes build up a full collection good so we have one question here from someone uh one dr harsha is asking if it's sto with storytelling is it possible with elders who are smarter than us please brief on this uh just read it again please yeah so what he is point is if the patient is for example is older than us and even smarter than us can we still use stories i, I want to i guess he is feeling like they, they should not feel like we are talking to the, down to them and how do we go about that basically i i wouldn't you have to put the patient's well being this patient has come to me maybe older maybe younger maybe this generation that gender it makes no my task is to give the person the best i have to give them instructions and i have to use whatever means i have of making those instructions memorable and actionable so i i think it is 
it's an unnecessary anxiety that you're building in if you stay fit focused. My task is, you know, come to me. You're a very senior person. I hope you'll follow the instruction, but the odds are that you won't, at least not fully. So if I can combine it with some form of storytelling that, that by the time they leave you, you've seen from their face, they've understood it, they felt the need to do it, and they're going to take action. Right. So we have one more question is, does storytelling need to be real life events or can we use real uh, story made to convince uh, the patient? Can, can we basically build a story to convince the patient? Uh, Steve Denning answers this quite well. The stories have to be fundamentally and emotionally true. You can, you know, alter the facts, not alter the fact, but I mean, downplay the facts a little bit, um, but they have to fundamentally be true. So, the Steve Denning brings up three points in that talk. So if you see it, he addresses it very nicely. And so don't, don't revert to BS because you think you're going to get a good outcome. You'll be seen through. So they must be at least emotionally true. That means they had that effect on you. And please do not you know, falsify them. Can I ask you something? Now, we are trying to build a science, build something around science. So when I know for a fact that the outcome of say the patient spitting is harmful to him. And I know what are the outcomes, what will happen if the patient does. Can't I build a story using those facts? Yeah, anything that makes your instruction, it's, it's any, you want the patient to understand these instructions. This is what I want them to comprehend. And then use a story to make those instructions memorable and actionable. So whatever works, as long as you can find a conflict in a resolution, this is the core, so. so I yeah, so essentially it is not like I, I should have had a patient for who every one of those things happened and then I'm going to relate it. I can actually build on facts that are available to us. As an example, it's just to drive a point. What do you think about that? Uh, again, just ask me the question. No, no I, I was just uh, summarizing from my own point that uh, it is not necessary that if I'm using a story, it is something that has essentially happened to me or to someone I know. As long as the facts are correct, when, when we are using it to give instructions to patients. So as long as I'm actually using scientific facts and I'm only basically just saying, uh, you know, adding it up rather than telling a patient, you know, if you don't do this, what science we have found that 80% of the cases will develop this. And that's not going to stay with the patient. So, but if I can say that if you don't do this, what we have seen is many patients, or you know, it, it will become this, then it is more likely to be followed. But yes, carefully. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. But there you're going to another aspect of public speaking rather than storytelling. If you're in your public speaking, if you can be convincing and charming and cajoling all at the same time, then the communication is very effective. <laughs> that means they must sense a threat to their own well-being. If they don't follow what you're telling them, they must. Charming means they basically like you. They will. They, I, the, I like this doctor. I'm going to follow the instruction. Convincing it must make sense. So this combination of convincing, charming, and cajoling is uh, the foundation of effective communication. Does that answer your question? I think we got it. Yes, it did. It did. So I think basically what we need to do now is we need to do a session on public speaking. Besides which. <laughs> Yes. Okay. I think uh, there were no more uh, questions. There was nothing else on the chat. So, so let, let me just make a I bit think of a you are essentially good. Yes, please. Okay. When I was a marine engineer, I came across this term. It was called, you're expected to provide a duty of care. This combination of having a sense of duty and care really stuck with me. So today, if you want to become better at something, whether it's professional sports, we talk a lot about perseverance and grit and passion and ambition, and, but we don't really focus on how powerful a duty of care can be in driving us forward as we seek excellence in our profession. So this ability to, what is my duty of care here? And that can be strengthened and reinforced by understanding the power of storytelling. I want to close with something I heard you saying in the beginning, Mandana. I even wrote it down. I am convinced that every role in dentistry will have better outcomes if we master the art of storytelling and public speaking. Let me close by 
stating this slightly differently. Every oral pathologist can be a better oral pathologist by being a better speaker and storyteller. Every dentist can be a better dentist by being a better speaker and storyteller. And I use this theme with whichever audience I speak about. Every business owner, every leader, every professional can be a better business owner, better leader, better professional by being a better speaker, a better storyteller. Every lawyer can be a better lawyer by being a better speaker and storyteller. The, the basic concept remains the same. To get outcomes, you have to have your technical skill, but they have to become actionable. So let me close with this. Everyone in dentistry can become better in dentistry by being a better speaker and storyteller. Thank you. Yes, perfect. True. I am I'm definitely convinced. So, okay, everybody, thank you for being with us. Uh, let's say bye to you. And uh, I certainly hope you will follow this through and we can all work to being better public speakers and definitely better storytellers. It will do us much good. Thank you and good night. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.